is already on. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Hi. So you don't have to listen to me for too long. Just wanted to welcome you to the Spotlight Initiative event. Uh, and welcome you to keep enjoying some food and wine. We're going to start the panel in about 10 minutes. So you have a bit of time to uh, do the gallery walk. We've got some stories of allies, advocates, and survivors that we are connected with through Spotlight. Our theory of change is up there. Some information on the countries we support. So some of those burning questions you already have, you might get answered even now. And then we'll, we'll bring our amazing panelists up in about five to 10 minutes. So enjoy the wine and food in the gallery.
All right, if the panelists could come to the stage for me, please. We're going to get started in just one minute. It doesn't matter where you sit. No, I'm going to sit. I'm going to sit my chair as I can, so I can kind of be in and out. But otherwise, it doesn't matter where you sit. Where's Dr. Hook? Is he here? Check your mics. Steve, does that mic work? Yes. It works, yep. Yours does not. There he is, yeah. Welcome. All right. Okay, a, a very warm welcome to all of you. Is it working? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for sticking with us for this. Uh, later in the day uh, panel discussion and celebration, hopefully, uh, and hopefully a very candid discussion about the Spotlight Initiative to End Violence Against Women and Girls. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you already know about Spotlight to some degree? You feel like you have a, a fairly good familiarity. Okay, great. So this is really helpful to me because I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about what Spotlight is. I want to get down into why do we need to care about Spotlight, what makes it different, and the reason we had you all drink wine first is we want some really candid questions from you. We want your feedback, we want your questions, we really want to understand what your perspective is on this initiative and where you see your role might be in supporting it or challenging it or whatever you think is your role in in, in Spotlight, or, or if you don't see a role, that's fine to hear as well. So we've got some really amazing panelists. Maybe I'll just first introduce myself. My name is Erin Kenny, and I am the technical lead of the Spotlight Initiative. I'm based in New York. Um, we sit in the Secretary General's office. As you know, for those of you, the 80% the of you who are familiar with Spotlight, you might know that we are a partnership of the United Nations and the European Union. So we've got our headquarters in New York under Amina Mohammed, who's the Deputy Secretary General, and then uh, our partners in Brussels. We've got a pigeon with us. It's the official mascot of Spotlight. Spotty, the pigeon, is going to be with us today. Um, and of course, really great panelists. And, and we've, we've selected these panelists because they are actually on the ground experiencing different elements of Spotlight. And we want them to talk about their real lived experiences of Spotlight. And then also for you all to have different perspectives on what this looks like and different perspectives for your questions. So it's not just coming from my secretariat hat. So first I'd like to introduce Melissa Alvarado. She is with uh, UN Women's Regional Office in Bangkok. She oversees their Ending Violence Against Women and Girls work. And she is also going to be talking about our first Spotlight initiative, which is the Safe and Fair program. And I'm not going to give more away than that because she'll, she'll be talking about it. And then I've got Nicolette Naylor. Nicolette is with the Ford Foundation, and she oversees their violence against women and girls work. Nicolette is our member of our global civil society reference groups. We've got civil society reference groups at every level of Spotlight. And our global one um, is represented today by Nicolette. So thank you. Welcome. Zainab Suleiman is a civil society uh, activist working out of Nigeria. She's with COFEM, uh, and she is with us to talk about civil society in Nigeria and kind of the challenges and opportunities to working with civil society in a context like Nigeria, and some of her perspectives of Spotlight from that position. And then finally, last but certainly not least, we've got Dr. Sansel Buk, who is with the minister, the, he's the deputy national director for gender. Uh, in Mozambique, and he's been involved with Spotlight from the very beginning. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that we've got another ally and advocate from Mozambique in the room. You heard her speak this morning. 
She is on our National Civil Society Reference Group. So, Hosina, Michelle, can you just wave? Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. All right, so uh, despite the fact that most of you are quite familiar with Spotlight, I'm gonna do my due diligence and just do a quick, like what I call my five minute elevator pitch if somebody's asking me what Spotlight is. All right, so it was launched about two years ago, and I, you know, I still think of this as a new initiative, but it's actually been kind of up and running to some degree for two years. It's a, the big headline of Spotlight is always the money, right? Everyone talks about Spotlight because it's a half a million, half, half a billion, so 500 million euros of actually seed funding. So the idea is that this funding from the European Union will stimulate other donors to come on board through a multi-partner trust fund. It is a, a sustainable development goal initiative. It's a model fund for the sustainable development goals, contributing directly to sustainable development goal, goals 5 and 16. But as uh, Amina Mohammed often says, it's the docking station for all of the other SDGs with the understanding that if we're going to achieve all of the SDGs, we have to eradicate violence against women and girls. Uh, as I mentioned, our first program was a thematic program uh, covering the ASEAN region that's focused on labor migration and trafficking uh, and violence against women and girls in the context of labor migration. Uh, the next region that we have invested in is Latin America with five countries, Argentina, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico. We've got eight countries in Africa, Liberia, Malawi, Mali, Mozambique, Niger, Nigeria, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. Uh, so those are off the ground. Funds went to those, to those, to the Africa and Latin America in early, earlier this year, so early 2019, and we're started implementation in those countries. Next to come will be in early 2020. We will be launching programs in the next, the last three regions actually of Spotlight. So we'll be um, committing all the funds. So we'll have four countries in the Pacific, Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste, Vanuatu, and Samoa, and a small multi-country uh, program for Fiji, the Marshall Islands, and the Solomon Islands. We'll have six countries in the Caribbean, so Jamaica, Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, Belize, Guyana, and Grenada, and three countries in Asia, Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. Uh, I know I'm gonna get a question about how these countries were selected. That's usually one of the first questions I get. Uh, it was um, a really uh, interesting process of review of prevalence data, review of a number of different kind of set indicators, and then a review of kind of soft data around uh, presence of civil society and space for civil society to work, engagement of the government and commitment of the government to ending violence against women and girls, strength of the UN system through which this is coordinated, um, and a number of other factors. So security of the, of the country, so we weren't looking at highly insecure countries where we had higher risks for the program to have to be completely shut down. Though we are, as you can see, looking at some, uh, quite a few countries that fall within that humanitarian development nexus. And that's been a really interesting aspect of this program is to really interrogate that space between the humanitarian and development nexus. Um, some of the choices we made were also based on the financial envelopes for each of the regions, which varied widely. So for Africa, we had a 250 million euro investment. For Asia, which is a massive continent, we had 40 million. So we also had to make pretty extreme decisions on how to invest based on the context, the countries. We did look at things like absorption capacity. We did consider that as a factor as well and what other programs were already in a country before we decided. But of course, you know, this is, this is a program between two of the largest bureaucracies in the world, the European Union and the United Nations. So a lot of that also just came from political, uh, kind of the political pressures and insights from those two major bodies in terms of priorities for funding within the European Union and the UN system. And so I would be remiss if I wasn't honest about that as well. There was a political element to the decisions that were taken. 
This, this program is coordinated by the Deputy Secretary General and the Secretariat is under her office. There are three core agencies plus UNICEF as the, the main drivers of this initiative and, the, and often the main implementers on the ground. Uh, that's UN Women, UNFPA, and UNDP, and I mentioned also UNICEF. And then on the ground, we've engaged WHO, uh, IOM, UNESCO, OHCHR, ILO, and others. Another thing, and I don't have a slide on it, but it's in our theory of change. Another question I always get is about thematic focus areas. So one of the things that the EU really wanted was that in each region there be a specific kind of pinpoint focus. So in Latin America, it's femicide. In Africa, it's sexual and gender-based violence, harmful practices, and sexual and reproductive health and rights. In the Pacific, it's, um, it's intimate partner violence. In the Caribbean, it's family violence. In Asia, it's uh, sexual and gender-based violence. And this was really not to exclude all other forms of violence against women and girls, but to have some element where we could measure a narrow focus on one of the most prevalent types of GBV happening in that context. So for example, femicide in Latin America, we have specific indicators for that region around femicide that are unique to that region that we are going to be measuring. Uh, some of the things that make Spotlight a bit unique, it is uh, meant to mobilize the entire UN system around an area where we haven't always seen the whole UN system coming together. And the idea behind this is not that everyone in the UN system has to suddenly have expertise in this area, but that we're harnessing the system to bring in comparative advantages. Um, so that we can be really comprehensive in our approach. So we can, you know, UNDP is coming in not just because they have great GBV programs, but also because they're doing so much on the sustainable development goals and transforming institutions to be more gender equitable. So we're trying to really galvanize the non-traditional partners within the UN system to be, to kind of come into this in a way that they might not have otherwise done. I mentioned it's a sustainable development goal implementation fund and it aligns with the SDG principles of human rights leaving no one behind and universality. I'm going to talk about this quite a bit on this panel and, and I know our panelists will as well. There's a high emphasis on building national capacity and ownership for the program, so a heavy investment in national women's movements, feminist movements uh, and governments, particularly in ministries of gender, but also extending beyond the ministry of gender. So in some countries, coordination of spotlight falls under the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Planning, so it might be under a non-traditional ministry. Um, uh, I'm going to skip central role of civil society, we've talked about that, and we take a really comprehensive approach to violence. Our theory of change is over there, we've got six pillars, they're not radical. They're kind of what you'd expect, laws and policies, changing institutions, preventing violence, ensuring services, collecting and making sure there's better data available, and building feminist and women's movements or supporting women's movements in a country. Leaving no one behind is an SDG principle and we're not unique in it challenging us. This idea of how do we reach uh, populations that aren't legally recognized. How do you reach populations that in highly insecure contexts in a, in a given country? So it's really been a challenge, particularly for the UN system, to think, think about how to operationalize that. I talked about our theory of change, I already went through that. Um, and then just kind of a snapshot. One of the, the things I think makes Spotlight a bit unique is the way that we intentionally invest in civil society. Uh, we have pillar six, which was driven by civil society, so that wasn't an original pillar in Spotlight. Spotlight had five pillars. And from the really great advocacy of civil society, we added the sixth pillar on, on supporting national women's movements and feminist movements as, um, as kind of a reflection that the evidence shows that that's one of the greatest sustainers of success of programs in a given context. It's the strength of its women's movements. We've also asked that 30% of all funding that goes into a country go to civil society, and of that, at least 70% go to national civil society. Um, and we are partnering with both the UN Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women and Girls and the Women, Peace and Humanitarian Fund for some discrete demand-driven grants in spotlight countries and also for Africa across the continent. So that's it for me. You guys will have a chance to ask me questions, but I am really eager to turn to our panelists now. I'm going to start with you, Melissa. You guys were first out of the gate for Spotlight. You, you, you've been there before me. 
so you know you know a lot more. Um, and I think one of the things that I find really unique about your program is its emphasis on women migrant workers, and we haven't really we haven't seen that before. Um, we know that women migrant workers are disproportionately vulnerable to violence at all stages of the migration cycle and often experience intersectional forms of discrimination. Uh, so how is Spotlight changing this? And what is important about Spotlight for women uh, and girl migrant workers? Thanks, Erin. Uh, and welcome, everyone, to this session. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak here and to talk about Spotlight and share a few things about what we're doing. Um, I'm aiming to be a bit brief and concise and uh, just get to the point and tell you just a little bit of the story of what we're doing in our Spotlight program. So I want to start out and say that we start from the perspective that when migration is a choice, it's an expression of agency and can be a vehicle for empowerment. And that's really sort of where we start from. Uh, we do recognize, however, you know, very honestly, that women migrant workers do experience and do sometimes have a heightened vulnerability to violence and trafficking throughout the migration experience. Um, and these, these risks for violence and for trafficking come from intermediaries like recruitment agencies, employers, their own partners, strangers, um, and they often have little access to services, justice, protection, additional safety when they need it. And so through the Spotlight Initiative, we developed a program that puts women migrant workers at the center so we could better understand what are their experiences, what are their needs. Um, so we call this program Safe and Fair, Realizing Women Migrant Workers' Rights and Opportunities in the ASEAN region. And so this program operates across the 10 Southeast Asian nations of, of ASEAN. And it's a collaboration between the International Labor Organization, UN Women, and the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. Uh, and so when we began the Safe and Fair program, we did national consultations across all these countries to speak to women, to speak to governments, to talk to civil society, and to find out, you know, was this an important issue that we needed to be addressing and what should we do, be doing about it? And I want to share something that one of the leading women's rights activists told us. And what she said to us was that she had never been to a labor migration meeting or a meeting about labor migration that had as its focus violence against women. And she said, I can't tell you how long I've been wanting to have a meeting just like this. You know, she pointed to the agenda and she said, I just cannot believe that this is actually happening. Um, she told us that she often went to labor migration meetings and found that violence against women was mentioned maybe at the end of a long list of possible concerns related to migration and women, but it was never explored in much detail and wasn't really given this type of elevation and emphasis. Um, and she also said that as a, as a women's rights organization, they've been trying to come into the space of labor migration meetings and discussions and talk about this. And they were always told, you know what, it's okay, we've got the gender component covered, you know, we're, we're addressing women's issues, it's fine. And so what we were so grateful to hear is that Safe and Fair, this program that we've developed, is really allowing us to do just exactly what she had been wanting to do and, and, and we are we're now working with her to do, which is to bring this kind of conversation together, to bring the labor and migration and trafficking actors with the experts on ending violence against women, with those civil society actors, and to really build a better understanding about what are the needs of these women and what can we do better to support them through policies, through services, through prevention. And so this is exactly what this program is doing. Um, and so we're able to bring together people in a new way, which is exactly what Aaron was talking about. We're really expanding our scope beyond sort of the traditional ending violence against women actors, which are our core, and reaching beyond and reaching a bit further to leave no one behind, in this case, women migrant workers. So I'll stop there. Uh, I think that's a little summary of what we're doing. Thanks. Great, thanks. Thanks, Melissa. So I, I want to give a particular appreciation to Nicolette. I'm going to ask her a question ne next, but Nicolette had a knee injury before this and almost didn't make it, and her commitment, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm just so grateful that you're here. I just want to say that. Um, and, and for your commitment to spotlight into the issue, so thank you. Um, so, Nicolette, as you know, one of the key partners of the Spotlight Initiative is civil society. Uh, Spotlight, we talk a lot about how we're trying to shift the existing power dynamics by centering the role of civil society, in particular local grassroots and women's rights organizations. 
as an SDG fund, Spotlight is trying to challenge the status quo in the UN's partner engagement and inclusion and to set a precedent for other funds and programs. So that was a lot of jargon. What does that mean to you? Um, and especially coming from your role in the Global Civil Society Reference Group. Thanks, Erin, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks, everyone. I think that the role of civil society, what makes the Spotlight Initiative so important, and I think you alluded to it earlier, is often when there's big pots of money, it's very hard to know who decides, who frames the agenda, who gets the resources, who manages to give input into the agenda. And often civil society and women's rights organizations are just seen as the recipients of the funding as opposed to meaningfully participating in the framing of the agenda and the strategies um, and monitoring how that money actually gets spent. So having a global civil society reference group, our role is really to see that, to give input into strategies, to identify the gaps, and things aren't perfect. I think we're not used to working in mechanisms like this, and we're hoping that a mechanism like this can actually assist other donors um, in terms of having civil society at the table in terms of the framing of strategy and the identification of gaps and helping to make decisions around where the money goes and who gets the money. I think with large amounts of money, tensions and fragmentation often happens in the sector um, in an environment that's fraught with competition. And so I think having a mechanism where you're trying to bring people together to coordinate and partner between government and civil society um, helps to alleviate that. And I think that civil society then gets to monitor that and monitor themselves in, in the process. I think the accountability piece is important. Often we have this mechanism of civil society being accountable to donors and there isn't an accountability of donors to civil society. And so we like to see this role of the civil society reference group as a two-way accountability mechanism where Spotlight and the EU and large amounts of money is actually there's some accountability back to civil society. And I think for the skeptics in the room, it's always, you say, this big bureaucratic machinery. How are you possibly going to influence it? I think we can see this in when the initiative started, there were five outcomes, five pillars. There wasn't a sixth pillar on the importance of women's rights movements, despite the research showing that women's rights movements need to be at the center of a change agenda. And I think thanks to civil society's voice and agitation for that, and the willingness of the Spotlight Initiative to then hear that and adapt the program to create this pillar six has been an important inroad and a different way of working. So I see enormous potential for donors, for all donors beyond initiatives at the UN or EU level, and I come from a donor agency, to try to think about how we shift power, seed power, and sit around the table with civil society and let civil society help us make decisions, because you often know better than we do in terms of where money should be going. Great. Nicolette, thank you. Um, so we have an incredibly dynamic global civil society reference group, and we're going to be referring you quite often to our website because we were, we, we were very green here. We did not bring a lot of documents. So included on our website is bios for everyone on our global reference group as well as information on, on how to reach out to us if you have more questions. But it's interesting because I, I think uh, we've been talking about civil society as a bit of a monolith, right? And we know it's not. And even you know, within women's civil society, there's a lot of diversity. And then you start to think about, oh, but people who are working with faith-based organizations, how do we engage them in this? What about people living with disabilities? That's a critical uh, group of people to reach, but they don't often identify as feminist or women's organizations. So how do we bring them on board as well? And so when you enter into a country like Nigeria, where Zainab is going to speak, you have this amazing diversity of civil society and even again within the women's movements there an incredible diversity and even some tensions between them. So Z, I'm going to ask you, tell us a little bit about civil society in Nigeria and what role Spotlight Initiative can or should play in supporting that diversity in those movements from your perspective. Okay, is this on? 
Okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd say that um, civil society, there's a difference between civil society and the feminist movement in Nigeria. Um, there are some overlaps, but generally at this point in time, um, a lot of the feminist movement is led by young feminist activists and women's rights organizations that are at the grassroots level, um, while the CSOs are usually led by older generations and have kind of regressed in some ways. Um, and I think thinking about that, um, we realize that a lot of the young feminists have the energy, have the zeal, have the, they, they take action, um, be it on social media or on the, on the um, local level, but they have limited access um, to funding, to, institutional, to institutions and power in general. Um, and I think that Spotlight can help with bridging that gap and especially supporting young um, youth engagement because that in Nigeria, the youth tend to lead more now and I mean, there was recently a, a documentary, I don't know if anyone has seen it, on sex for grades, and that was, one of my friends participated in that, and they were all young girls, they're less than 30, and you can see from that how, and this has been going on for years, it's not the last 10 years, it's been over 40 years that this has been happening in universities, but it took young women to decide that we need to expose these professors. Some of those professors had been doing this for 20 years, and that's just to say that there needs to be more involvement with um, youth organizations um, because they are alive and thriving and um, they just don't have access to these spaces and they need that. Thank you, thank you. So this is also, as I mentioned, and I hope you're still drinking wine and eating good food, a space for feedback, like critical feedback. So, you know, like we need to do better to work with young feminist organizations is already some really good feedback, by the way. Um, so thank you, Z. Our, um, our next panelist is coming from the government of Mozambique. Government, you know, I work at the United Nations, so government is the most critical partner that we have, and we know that for any initiative, essential to sustaining change, because we need to actually ensure that government have the resources, the skills, the interests, the goodwill, the capacity, all of it, to be able to carry on whatever investments we make. So Dr. Sansa Buk is uh, with the Ministry of Gender, and I'm going to ask you a question specific to the role of government. Uh, so tell me, in Mozambique, what is the role of government in the fight against uh, sexual and gender-based violence and harmful practice? And tell me a bit about also how you're engaging civil society in this. Thank and you. Uh, first, first of all, I, I would like to say that um, in Mozambique, uh, the, the main role of the government in, in the fight of GBV uh, is mainly driving the coordination because the coordination is one of the uh, key and crucial uh, as aspect. Uh, and also uh, the government of Mozambique uh, designing uh, policies, uh, national action plans, uh, strategies, uh, and uh, uh, another, uh, another uh, tools that can uh, be used to implement programs in the, in, the, in, in the country. Also, the government create a good environment for the implementation of the GBV uh, programs. Uh, in, in Mozambique, uh, the working between civil society and the government is one, one, one of the best. Uh, I, I can assume that because uh, uh, for a long time we created um, a gender coordinating group and uh, also we creating uh, uh, another group that is a, 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 a group that coordinates issues related with the, um, violence, violence, not only GBV but violence in, in general. We, we, we have also in Mozambique uh, related with the uh, uh, related with experience with the civil society uh, uh, in, in in the country, every steps done by civil society, the government is uh, involved. Involved also um, every steps done by government, we 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 invite civil society to 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 go to, together. Uh, for example, uh, next in the Next, next month, in November, we are going to uh, celebrate 16 days 
uh, of violence uh, uh, against uh, of activism on, on on violence against women and girls. Uh, we 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 design the the program uh, of commemoration of this uh, if married with the with, with civil society civil society uh, you United Nations agencies uh, in certain cases we involve also private private sector um, uh, in the context of spotlight we have a steering committee and in this steering committee we we, we, we have a, a great involvement of civil society. Uh, we, we as a, a government, we played an important role also in the establishment of the civil society uh, reference group related with the, with the spotlight. Um, this, this is a, a Mozambique experience related to, with the work with the civil society, also the role of the, the government in, in general. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna circle back and ask one last question to each of the panelists. So start thinking about your question for all of us, or questions. I hope we'll have enough time to get to as many of them as we can. Um, I'm going to uh, ask Melissa now to, um, to talk about, I think, I actually think we changed this question. Yeah, so, so Spotlight was launched two years ago. And about six months into the project, uh, the EU was like, so what's the impact? Yeah, no, really. So two years in, we're actually delighted that we can at least talk about safe and fair because they, they were up and running two years ago. So I'm gonna ask Melissa to already share some of the stories of how safe and fair investments have, have helped women and girls um, who are engaged in, in, migrant, in, migrant, in labor migration. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron, for the question. And again, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, so as I mentioned before, one of the things that we're really focused on in the context of this Safe and Fair program is bringing together the labor and the migration and the trafficking and the violence against women people to one table to have a common conversation. And I want to be a bit honest and say, this is not always an easy conversation or a comfortable conversation. There's a lot of honesty that people don't really want to be having about the risks that migrants face. You know, this is not always something that unions and employers and governments want to be, be, be honest about and be forthright about. And so it's been something that we've had to navigate very carefully. But we've been able to do that. And we've been able to bring these people together and say, look, you know, we, the problem is not solved. There is a problem there. This is something that we need to be addressing. And so I want to tell you a little bit about a direction that the program has taken in one country, in Vietnam, which I think gives us an, uh, an example of where we even see our future going. So in Vietnam, we've brought this kind of challenging conversation to these actors at the national level. We did that also at a regional level. We brought together our nine, nine of the 10 ASEAN countries to kind of hopefully socialize this conversation a bit more comfortably among these different actors who very much don't always agree. And then as a result of that, we had, we had people at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Vietnam come to us and say, you know what, we realize this is a conversation that we should be actually having. And we'd like you to come and train our foreign service officers who work around the world, in the Gulf, across Southeast Asia, Latin America, other parts of the world, to see how can they provide assistance to their citizens, whether they're migrants or tourists or just you know, citizens who are working abroad to be able to address this issue. So we did that, we did that, I did that a few weeks ago. And you know, we had like a hundred of these consular officials, foreign service officials, and what they told us was they had never really ever paid attention to this, it had never been part of their training, there was, they had no protocols, no, you know, no, no really way, no plan to address this. So we were able to say, look, this is something that we can assist you with. Here's the basics. Here's some tools. They were very happy to have things like communication tools, how to talk to survivors. And we've agreed that we're going to work with them to help shape policies and protocols to be able to assist their citizens better. And so we see that this is an important trajectory that is taking us in a new direction. And we're able to build on what we know from women, from civil society, and integrate that into what the government is doing and how the government treats these issues and how they treat their, um, their populations abroad as well as at home. And so we're really excited about that. And I think that that's just an early win in our view, 
um, and, we, and we see that much more is coming, and we're looking at maybe even doing a regional convening of foreign affairs on this topic. Thank you. Thanks. Melissa is also working on Liz to get the next SVRR to be in her region so we can hear a lot more about safe and fair. <laughs> I thought that, I thought, you know, maybe Bali, something like that. I, I'm not, I have no self-interest in that at all. Um, all right, so Nicolette, we're going we're gonna to bring a little Kimberly Crenshaw into the room and talk about intersectionality. Um, you, you bring an intersectional lens to your work with uh, women and girls through your work with minorities, men and boys, and LGBTQI populations, which aligns directly with Spotlight's Leave No One Behind principle. Um, so what does, kind of, what does that principle mean to you, just generally and then in the context of Spotlight? And what challenges can you see with us really being able to operationalize that principle? Thanks, Erin. This is my favorite. <laughs> my favorite topic. I think we first, just to start, we have to acknowledge that intersectionality and an intersectional lens, it's almost become like this new sexy word that everyone's using and often using incorrectly. Um, intersectionality is not integrated programming. It's not integrated programming. It's actually a theory of oppression and a political theory. And I think the work on violence against women and girls has been depoliticized for too long. And so an intersectional lens allows us to have a political analysis and a structural analysis to violence beyond just recognizing that women aren't monolithic and women have different identities that intersect with each other and multiple layers of oppression. Because I think the challenge is we have to go beyond naming it. We're all very good at naming and calling out the groups. Women and girls, LGBTQI, disability, um, migrant workers. We can name it, but we aren't translating that into policy responses and programmatic responses and infusing that in our work. And that requires us, I think there's an amazing opportunity here to really infuse a power analysis in our work because we've moved in the direction of target populations versus power. And so a power analysis would require us to actually grapple with exclusionary politics. And exclusionary politics plays out at government levels, the criminalization of LGBT groups, but it also plays out in our own organizations between white women and black women and indigenous women, between groups the way we treat disabled women we would have to start with an introspection on our own exclusionary politics and our own homophobia around whether we're including trans women in our analysis of violence against women and girls, because I've been in too many spaces where the violence against women sector is not willing to work with the trans sector, for example. And I think an opportunity in this work is cross-issue solidarity. We can start thinking about new ways of looking at solidarity and mutuality in a way that grapples with our own power and our own privilege, and then starts to hold governments accountable and mechanisms like the Spotlight Initiative accountable. Because I think it's easy for all of us to adopt the leave no one behind tagline, but it's about a meaningful participation, not just of leaving no one behind and not just naming population groups, but actually looking at the theories of oppression and history and context that drives this work and come up with some program responses that help us to do this work better. I think we're all still struggling with how to do intersectional work in a way that's infused in our programs and policies that's beyond just calling out the groups. And we could probably learn together, but we'd have to own the fact that we all have some politics that we have to address in, in this room probably and outside of this room. Was that controversial enough? Yeah, no, that was great. So, um, so our Global Civil Society Reference Group is a really special body of people that were actually selected by civil society to hold Spotlight accountable and to help us to be more radical in how we program and think. And so when we first formed this group, it had been a while, like I felt like we really didn't have that space yet. And as soon as the group was formed, I was like, can I create a WhatsApp and just ask them any question I have? 
is it felt like a, there was finally this space where we could actually have these deep discussions about the opportunities and challenges of Spotlight. So thank you for that, Nicolette. Z, I'm actually going to circle back to you last. I don't have a specific question for you, but I'm just going to ask you to, to do a final thought on whatever you want to talk about. You get, you get like a free, free question. So I'm coming to you last. All right, so Dr. Book, back to you about, um, about Spotlight in Mozambique. What is significant about Spotlight in Mozambique, and what makes it different from, you know, we, we've seen joint programs a lot. We've seen joint programs of the UN and government a lot. So why, why should we care about Spotlight? Why is it different? Thank, thank you. Um, for, in, my, in my opinion, um, the significance of Spotlight Initiative in, in Mozambique, uh, uh, this, this is a very, very interesting question uh, because um, uh, Spotlight uh, Initiative uh, in Mozambique is one of the uh, biggest initiatives that the country uh, is, 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 is looking for. Uh, in Mozambique, uh, the spotlight is going to support in a, in a large scale uh, families, uh, special, particular women and girls at the grass, uh, grassroots level. Because we know that um, uh, many people are suffering because of the lack of resources to implement programs, uh, concrete programs. With the spotlight, we are going to implement concrete actions. Uh, that is different if we compare with the other, uh, other, other programs. Uh, the, 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 the concrete programs uh, will be implemented in, in the, uh, a large scale uh, at the district level. District level. In Mozambique, we are going to implement the spotlight in three provinces and ten districts. One, one province in north of the country, another, another province in the center of the country, another in the south. Uh, uh, according, according with the, uh, what is happening in the country, this is very important. Uh, and uh, what makes uh, Spotlight different from other joint initiatives? Uh, one of the things is that uh, this initiative is going to um, support the country in, in, uh, in many areas, uh, particularly in the uh, capacity building. Yeah. In the capacity building, we are going to um, train uh, people. Uh, we are going to, um, uh, to, 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 with the spotlight, we, we are going to, um, to, to buy also, to buy uh, vehicles because we have a lack of vehicles in the districts, at the district levels. We, we are going to buy motorbikes, bicycles. We are going also to, um, to buy furniture for, for, for some centers, for, for some, some centers that we, we assist uh, the victims of violence. Uh, Spotlight, because of the uh, European Union um, pro pro procedures, uh, not allow the country to, to build centers for victims uh, or shelters uh, for victims of violence, but uh, uh, they allow it to rehabilitate. We are going to use some houses uh, to rehabilitate them, to, uh, to assist uh, the people, uh, victims of, of, of violence. And this for me is what makes difference uh, if we compare with the other. Uh, initiatives because with the spotlight we have uh, different pillars. We, we are going to revise uh, laws uh, using uh, spotlight resources. Uh, we are going to reinforce the role of civil society, uh, even even the private private sector. And this for me is, is a wonderful if we, we compare with the with the other uh, different initiatives that uh, we can see uh, along the country. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so this serves as your two-minute warning before the questions are going to come. I'm giving, I promise Z, the last word, any reflections from what she's heard on the panel that she wants to, 
to share with you while you guys get your questions ready, but also listen to her. Don't get so distracted planning your question. Z. My final words would be for Spotlight to ensure that there's um, transparency and accountability not only between Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, not only between Spotlight and other UN or, um, agencies and CSOs, but also to ensure that there's transparency and accountability between the feminist movement, as I mentioned earlier, the young feminists and the CSOs, because there's often a lot of um, information isn't passed well between them, and I think that that's why a lot of CSOs, there are a lot of organizations that haven't lived beyond five years because they refuse to pass the baton down. Um, and I think that Spotlight can bridge that gap. And to also ensure that the definition and the um, focus on violence against women is strong and clear and is communicated well to um, civil societies because there are a lot of organizations as well who say they work on these issues but don't really work on these issues. Um, so just to ensure that that's very clear. And lastly, just to ensure that women and girls are at the center and are included throughout the process because a lot of times in Nigeria, I can't speak for any other country, um, but when organizations, foreign organizations come, they think that they can engage with community leaders and they believe they are the stakeholders and oftentimes these community leaders are men and aren't, don't always have the best interests of um, the women at heart. So it's important to make sure that women and girls are centered. All right, so what I'd like to do, we've got two microphones. I'm gonna take, uh, I'm gonna take about five questions at a time, and then we're gonna try to synthesize them up here. So raise your hand if you've got a question for myself or the, the panelists. Okay, so, yep. Uh, thank you so much for the interesting uh, presentation. I had the opportunity to get some information on Spotlight beforehand because in Nigeria we worked out an interesting, I would say, marriage between the call to action on protection from GBV in emergencies and the Spotlight initiative in Adamawa State in the spirit of really uh, showing how the humanitarian actions within the humanitarian development nexus can actually be realistically achieved. So my question to Nigeria person is, I know that civil society organizations in Nigeria is very dynamic, different interests when you go to the Northeast, there are strong civil society networks in other regions, including at the federal level, there are also civil society organizations. One of the biggest challenges in Nigeria has been the passing of the Violence Against Person Provision Act, which is an act that should take care of uh, GBV. In one of the meetings the Attorney General of Adamawa State stated that the act does not make sense to them. Now my question is, in addition to the civil society, putting pressure on financial monitoring and so on. How is civil society organization in Uganda, no, in Nigeria, sorry, positioning themselves to actually put pressure to this government of Nigeria at the state level to make sure they domesticate the violence against person prohibition act, which is meant to protect women from GBV, considering Spotlight is supposed to address the harmful traditional practices as well. Thank you. Thank you. So can I ask, we're going to take a few more questions. We're going to uh, respond to your questions. So I love that you guys are talking and socializing. It's awesome, but it's really hard to hear up here. And I think for some of you, it's really hard to hear as well. So can I ask that if you are having a really awesome conversation, you can take <laughs> your wine, but just to like step outside a little bit, um, that would be great. And, and I promise this is a two-hour event. We got time. We got time here for questions, to socialize. We're going to be here all night, all night long. All right. Thank you. So next question, yes. Um, good evening. Dr. Um, Book, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you have brought up a very interesting um, issue, which I am not sure whether you will be able to, to answer. And perhaps I'll, I'll ask Erin to come in on this. Um, and it's about the, 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 the lack of shelters or the ability for the country to actually build shelters for victims and survivors of violence. 
one of the most important um, programs within the, 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 the spectrum of dealing with issues of gender-based violence is exactly, exactly creating safe spaces for women to be able to go into an emergency so that they have shelter, they have counseling, and they start the rebuilding and the, 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 the healing process. However, if, if, if we are only, and at this point it's as Mozambicans, if we are only able to rehabilitate what's existing, we will not be able to respond because we know that the existing shelters do not begin to actually address the need of what survivors of violence have. Now, for you, Erin, would be um, if a country, for example, identifies this kind of need, would then spotlight, um, be open to consider and, and, and perhaps open um, new avenues for, make, for funding and for actually responding adequately to this pandemic? All right, thank you. Um, you know, when, when you mentioned Mozambique, what immediately came to mind was the, um, the aftermath of the cyclone. And I was just trying to find out how responsive is the, this funding initiative that we are talking about to addressing issues pertinent to uh, violence against women and girls, considering that uh, I think with how the cyclone affected the country, it heightened the vulnerability of women and girls. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for explaining about your very good program and uh, it looks very interesting and also uh, I think uh, it will really make a big impact. I would like to know if uh, the program also looks at the issue of violence in the cyberspace. Sexual violence, cyber bullying, hate, sex torsion, those things. If uh, the program addresses those issues as well. Thank you. Thank you. I have three questions. <sighs> One, um, uh, um, I'd like to thank you for your presentation and the programs that you've uh, introduced. My name is Catherine. I work for a women's rights organization from Uganda. We work with refugees from both Congo and uh, South Sudan. Um, my, my number one question is you've talked about um, funding opportunities for national CSOs. How do we assess such fundings? Uh, so that we're able to uh, apply and see how best to, 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 to share some of our programs. Secondly, um, I'm not saying her names clearly. M Melissa? Yes. Uh, in your presentation on uh, migrant employment or opportunities for work, in the context of Africa, more especially Uganda, that has a lot of refugees but also voluntary migrants, uh, putting in mind the aspect of uh, the current situation, no, no much opportunities for employment, and so, do you have? Are you? Do you have any plan for, for instance, inter-country uh, support for foreign investment, so that we're able, they're able to create opportunities for employment? Because currently there's a lot of unemployment, but yet we have an influx of refugees. We have influx of voluntary migrations within the country. So is there any provision for this grant perhaps to support uh, initiatives that trigger investment or foreign investment within the country that can support opportunities for employment? Uh, because currently Uganda is giving equal opportunity for refugees and uh, migrants. However, there is a challenge of uh, the employment ground. So the question is, do you have a program that can support the country, perhaps have access to investment opportunities that can create more jobs? If not, I would suggest for that so that we're able to, to have such avenues for sustainability, but also for physical feasibility of such opportunities. And thirdly, my question goes to the minister, I think from Mozambique. He spoke about uh, initiatives that are to trigger 
the approaches to end of violence, talked about purchase of motorbikes, blah, 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 and the rest. How sustainable is this initiative after the end of the spotlight funding? And maybe how realistic is it? Do you have any plans for continuity of this program? Because I expect it to be able to be continuous as we come to end of violence against women. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, when will you shine a spotlight on the Middle East, please? It's decidedly lacking in your uh, format there. And I don't understand how you can deal with migrant workers if you don't have a spotlight on the Middle East. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's nice to be here. Uh, my name is Nabakoza Shakira, I'm from Uganda. I work for UNFPA Uganda on disability inclusion, and I am deaf, as you can see me signing. So I'd like to know, uh, you say that you have uh, the SDG ideology of leaving no one behind. When you talk about persons with disabilities, there are different categories of persons with disabilities with their respective needs. And if you're leaving no one behind, then you have to tackle each group with each specific needs. Because when you say it's a general program, then others are excluded even in that program. So if we want to achieve that development, then maybe we should take that into consideration. Thank you very much. All right. So these these are some of the best questions I think I've ever gotten on Spotlight, so it's clearly a highly sophisticated group we've got here. Um, I'm sure we'll have more after this, so if you have tolerance for it, we'll do another round after we answer these. Um, I hope I am reflecting everything correctly. Uh, so there was first a question around Nigeria. Um, and a consideration of both the humanitarian development nexus there and civil society's ability to effectively position itself to better advocate with the government. So, Z, do you want to talk to that in terms of the context and then I can talk about that in terms of spotlight? All right. All right, so, it's, so she's putting it back on me. Thanks, Z. Yeah, no, it's, it's cool, it's cool, we're good. Um, all right, so um, the... The interesting thing about Spotlight is that it kind of bookends the issue with these deep partnerships and investments with government and deep partnerships and investments in feminist movements, women's organizations, and other civil society entities in a country. And the idea of that bookended investment is to actually create that bridge and create that space where these two critical groups who are essential to sustaining anything that we do and are essential to getting anything off the ground um, can actually come together and have a safe space to talk. Now, Nigeria, there's a lot of diversity in civil society and, and um, Z is gonna talk about that. In some contexts, particularly in Latin America, Spotlight's the only, discussion of Spotlight Initiative is the only space in which civil society, particularly women's movements, and the government actually sit at the same table because the, it's such a contentious space. And it's not, this is really not an easy relationship because a lot of the civil society organizations that we are directly or indirectly funding may not be very popular with the government. And we're also partnering with the government. We are the United Nations. We're there with the permission of the government. So it's a little bit of an, it can be a little bit of an uneasy space. But one thing that we try to, to be okay with is to just, kind of stimulate that, that discomfort for a little bit, because in that discomfort, you can actually have change. Um, and so that's what we're really working on in countries like Nigeria and, and elsewhere. Okay, I just wanna say, um, I know that you also mentioned what CSOs can do um, regarding that bill that you mentioned. Um, and there have been, CSOs and feminists have put a lot of pressure on the government. I know in Lagos specifically, there have been a lot of um, rallies and lobbying on the government to change some of those policies and to enforce that act. Um, I know that a few years ago, there was um, 
a change with the child marriage law about nine years old versus 13 years old versus 18 years old. So I know that there is a lot of work that is being done, but hopefully with Spotlight, there can be that space. There has been a few spaces, but hopefully these, the spaces that have been created often don't result in change. And so hopefully with pressure, unfortunately, it takes a foreign um, <laughs> investment, I guess, to create those spaces, but hopefully that will make a change. Um, there were a few questions related to this idea of the humanitarian development nexus. There was a question about the impact of the cyclone on our programming in Mozambique, but also considerations we are investing in the north of Nigeria, and we're investing in, um, in host and refugee communities in Uganda, as just some examples of the ways in which we're investing in this humanitarian development nexus. It's really interesting because I come from a humanitarian background. I've got a lot of my old friends in the room here. And when I moved to, <laughs> when I moved to Spotlight, it, was, it felt like a really big shift. I'd been working in humanitarian spaces for over 20 years. And I came and I was like, uh-uh. This is not going to be a straight up development program. And I've been really grateful to find the blurred line there that we can, we can um, invest with Spotlight funds. When the cyclone hit, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Malawi, we immediately asked for funding to be reprogrammed to specifically address violence against women and girls in the context of the cyclone response. And we were able to do that because of the amount of investment and because we are already investing in those parts of a country that are the most vulnerable to disaster or conflict in order to ensure, you know, we know, and there's been increasing evidence around this, you invest in ending violence against women and girls, you are investing in peace you're investing in sustaining a more secure context. And so we are going into spaces where we can do that. Um, the question about investment in infrastructure. So I am not, I, I really am lucky that I don't have to know all the EU regulations. There is another person, she's called the head of the management unit and that's her job. But I do know that the EU is very um, tricky about infrastructure investments. One thing that I've realized over the last year plus of working with them is that they also are, are able to see value in addressing immediate needs. And there's a lot, of, there's a lot more flexibility in the funding than I think we, ought, we, we usually see. So they're going to say, just like they said about emergency response, they said, we don't do humanitarian response with Spotlight. Well, we, we actually are, to some degree. And they'll say, we don't invest in infrastructure. But we are to some degree in certain contexts and we have a justification for it. And there's a ways that you can work with the EU to try to understand what the flexibility is around that. So it's not like an easy yes or no, but it's, uh, it's important to have the dialogue to make, to make that space. Um, cyber violence. A few of our programs are addressing cyber violence. It's not an overt um, focus area for Spotlight, but it's an increasing area of interest within many countries, particularly in Latin America, we're seeing it um, as an area of investment with, within some Spotlight programs. I can't remember which ones, but I can also follow up with you. We were thinking actually of developing a, a kind of Spotlight position paper on this because it's coming up again and again to try to understand how we can do cyber violence interventions uh, better, because I don't think there's a lot out there on that. Um, how can national civil society organizations access funding? That's, a, that's actually literally the million dollar question. Um, there's a few ways. So one is through local calls by the UN agencies who are receiving the funding. So all of the funding goes directly from the multi-partner trust fund to the UN agencies who are the, call them the recipient UN organizations in that country and then from them to civil society. There have been a whole bunch of different mechanisms to do this. With some countries, each agency just sending out their own unique calls for proposals and getting their applicants in. In some contexts, there's been a joint call for proposals and an extended period of time. An actual, uh, I think Malawi, they did a lot of outreach. So they started with an ex a call for expressions of interest. So they just got like literally paragraph expressions of interest that could be handwritten that could be like, you know, really that could be even texted in. It was really the, like all the different ways just to reach the grassroots. Based on that, they, they went back and asked for people to develop proposals, but they went out 
into communities. They didn't just like post it on the internet and assume people would apply. They went into communities, they did workshops, they talked about how to apply for spotlight funding, they helped them with proposal development. We're not seeing that as much as I would like. I think we, we, um, we're really trapped in the tension that we experience between quick implementation, this pressure to deliver really fast and to deliver impact really fast. It is no joke. And the pressure that we're, we're putting on ourselves because it's so important to implement differently and to reach partners we've never reached before and to work with partners who may have never worked on violence against women and girls but are reaching a critical population we've never accessed before. And I, you know, I, I talk to people a lot who are in the middle of, of this in a country and I, I, it's just it's making people's heads kind of explode to try to navigate that tension, that space between quick implementation, delivery on results, and doing things differently, which means slowing things down. It just means slowing things down. Um, so that's the, the, the answer to that. Do you want to take the migration question? Do you want me to repeat it for you? Okay. Sure. So there was also a question around labor migration um, uh, that was, was a specific to Africa but directed at Melissa because of the program that she helps to run in ASEAN um, and around creation of job opportunities, the partnerships with um, private sector. I'm paraphrasing here, but I'm going to turn it to Melissa. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it's a great question that you brought about investments, uh, migration, and you know, I, I want to just say that the power of the joint program that we're implementing is partly because it's not just UN Women, but it's UN Women and the International Labor Organization. This is their specialty, <laughs> labor movements, uh, how we can implement uh, bilateral agreements between countries, enable migration, enable labor, make, make labor policies and migration policies safer, fairer, where countries are respecting the international norms, the international treaties that have been established. And so while, while labor migration is not my expertise per se, that is violence against women, I count on my colleagues at ILO to be able to bring that, as well as my colleagues at UNODC. And so we are very much focused on building safer and more gender sensitive labor migration policies. And we also are next month in December, hosting a, bi a, regional, a cross regional meeting between Africa and Southeast Asia to talk exactly about labor migration, how to make it safer, how are we implementing the global compact. And so these are some ways that we are building a bigger conversation that is cross border, that is cross regional, that is cross sectoral, and that does focus on women. And in, women are not always featured very well in these sort of large scale labor migration policies, treaties, et cetera. So we're bringing that attention. We're also bringing, in a careful way, in a sensitive way, a conversation about violence against women as well in the context of labor migration. So I wanted to add that. And while I've got the mic, I wanted to just touch a little bit on cyber violence. We are doing a separate study on cyber violence in Southeast Asia right now, which we will then be utilizing uh, within the context of Safe and Fair. And then someone asked the question about disability. And I thought I would share that we utilize quite regularly the joint UN framework on essential services. So for those of you who are familiar with the essential services package for women and girls subject to violence, it's very much about building multi-sectoral, coordinated, rights-based, survivor-centered services with a strong focus on intersectionality and really supporting any woman who experiences violence anywhere. And so we utilize that framework to address issues such as disability, LGBTI, you know, women anywhere uh, who need who needs those services, and so that really gives us a good platform that we're that we're able to jump from and to and to build better conversations and better networks and services as well. So I'll end with that. While we're on the um, subject of diverse of disability, because this is um, an area that we really um, work on very intentionally with Spotlight. And throughout the, the lifespan of Spotlight, there's, um, there's engagement of civil society at multiple levels. So in the actual program design, in the conceptual, in the very beginning when we're even choosing a country, we talk to civil society. In the design of the program, in the, then in the, the, this advisory group, civil society is on the steering committee. 
And so we rely on that feedback um, and we're very intentional about the inclusion of, of not just organizations working with people living with disabilities, but actually people living with disabilities themselves being on these, um, being in these spaces to help us to do better with our programming. But I think there's still a lot of space to learn in this area and I actually want to turn back to our panel for ideas on how Spotlight can make sure that we are effectively reaching people with multiple disabilities with diverse disabilities. Thanks, Erin, and thanks for that question. I think it's going to be key for us to think about who's leading the work around disability and how we make be quite explicit about funding disabled survivors and putting disabled survivors and disabled women and girls at the center of our programming because often we have other groups speaking on behalf of disabled um, communities. And then there's work internally within the disability rights movement that we don't just treat the disability movement as a monolithic movement the same way we shouldn't treat the feminist movement as a monolithic movement. But the same way we're tracking percentages of money that's going to civil society, it may be useful to track how much money is going to survivor-led organizations, disability-led organizations, women-led organizations, feminist organizations, so that there's some learning in this because it's a severely underfunded sector. Um, and we know that there's a need there, but the money isn't getting to groups, and let's do a deeper understanding of why that is rather than just supporting groups who are now saying they're going to work on this issue but are not necessarily led by disabled survivors. But thanks for that question. All right, I've just got a couple more questions to answer and then I'll get kind of a little bit of a read on the group if you want to keep going or of my panel who's done a Herculean job and might be feeling a little jet lagged. Um, all right, so there was a great question on sustainable, sustainability. So it's a huge, obviously a huge preoccupation. I mentioned investments in government, investments in women's movements. So those are two pillars, uh, or two kind of ways that we're really looking at sustainability. Um, another way is we have pillar two, which obviously you all know, is about uh, investing in more gender equitable institutions. So really looking at those pillars of a society, of a political system, like, a, like the finance ministry, like where, is, where does the money come from in a particular context and how do we get in there to make sure that there are systems for reallocation of government budgets that will go to ending violence against women and girls well beyond the lifespan of Spotlight. So we want to get out of there. We are not looking at Spotlight being a 20-year program. We want to be in. We want to do what we can do to change the systems to be better and more responsive for women and girls, to hold governments accountable for doing their due diligence, to invest in this area, to make sure we have strong civil society who have the capacity to apply directly for international funding so they don't need to go through the UN anymore or international NGOs to get funding. They can go directly and to make sure that this, this kind of ecosystem has what it needs, has the legs it needs, so that it's not reliant on outside funding anymore, that it can sustain its own change, and it can really organically drive that change from a perspective of what's happening and what's needed in the country. Um, final question I had was around Middle East. Middle East, yeah, how could I forget? I knew that question was coming, and I still forgot it. Uh, so the, the finance for Spotlight, the five regions of financing, and even the envelope. So I mentioned that Asia is our smallest envelope. Asia is our smallest envelope. 40 million for Asia. It's Asia. It's our smallest envelope. All of this was determined when the European Union decided to do this large investment in Spotlight. They didn't just suddenly get 500 million of new funding. They had to reallocate existing European Union funding at the kind of behest or permission or willingness of their regional, of their regional delegations, of their regional desks. And some did and some didn't, frankly. So we got Latin America, Caribbean, Pacific, uh, Asia, Africa, but Middle East said no. We're going to continue doing the funding the way we want to do it and we're not going to give this funding to Spotlight. That's not to say that another donor couldn't come if, I mean, hey, if there's a donor in the room right now and you think this is a really cool model, 
Awesome. We have a couple of different ways that people can fund Spotlight programs. One, obviously, is to give through the multi-partner multi trust fund. But another is if, if there's a desire to kind of keep the Spotlight model, if people think this is a great model, and you know, I don't know, maybe it is, we're going to see. Uh, I often call this the great Spotlight experiment because it kind of feels that way to me. Um, but uh, donors can also go directly to a country. And, and fund it, just kind of keeping the theory of change of Spotlight, keeping the framework of Spotlight, and get the built-in support from the Secretariat. Um, we have a, a kind of a nine-person core team and, and various other JPOs, interns, consultants who are really the driving force behind the Secretariat um, who we can mobilize in support of a new country with very little effort. So, um, so yeah, if there's any donors in the room with that extra 30 million for, you know, for Sudan, we'll take it. Uh, all right, panel, are you done? Are you cooked? Okay, the panel's cooked. But listen, yeah, huge, I mean, you guys are amazing. Um, so we've got time, we've got the room until nine. I'm gonna have a glass of wine and I'm really happy to talk to any one of you who would rather just come to me directly and ask questions. And I think some of the panelists might also be okay with that. So thank you for being here, and uh, thanks for your interest in Spotlight. Me. 